want today we'll continue talking about the the way of new life as we were talking about yesterday but did not have the opportunity to finish so today we'll continue talking about the new way or the way of new life the path of new life yesterday we were talking about the old life we looked into quite a few aspects of the old life to look and see what it's like this is absolutely necessary to recognize what the old life is to know it thoroughly and profoundly once we have really seen the old life clearly for what it is then we are able to deduce that there must be something else and then we begin to look for that which is the opposite of new life or the opposite of old life and this is where we begin to find the way of new life the old way or the old life is a life that is trapped by positive and negative it's a life where positive and negative are constantly arising and then the positive and negative causes self causes ego and then the self is the cause of of selfishness and defilements and then that is the cause of suffering pain and misery so the old life the old way is one of pos- the positive and negative causing ego causing selfishness causing dukkha but the new way of life or the new way the new life even if the positive and negative comes up it doesn't cause ego even though there might be some positive and negative happening it's not a source it's not the source of ego and so no dukkha arises but even beyond that there is the new life where the positive and negative doesn't arise at all so this is a a brief comparison between the the old way and the new way one ought to have some understanding and appreciation of nibbana nibbana is the pali word the sanskrit word with which people in the west are often familiar is nirvana both nibbana and nirvana mean coolness and one ought to have an understanding of what is meant by nibbana because this will then we have a sense of the goal of of the 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 new way of life and then we can move more steadily and more directly in that direction there are two kinds of nibbana or two levels of nibbana the first level is where even even though there is still feelings or experiences of positive and negative arising none of that positive or negative leads to ego leads to to self arising that's the first level of nibbana but in the second kind of nibbana the positive and negative don't arise there is no things are not experienced as positive and negative if we can understand what is meant by these by nibbana in these two levels then it will make it much easier to understand everything else the new way of life is the new way is that which 
protects against, prevents against the positive and negative, prevents positivism and negativism from, from arising? Or should anything positive or negative be, should, it, should the positive or negative happen? Should the mind experience things in that way? The new way of life will, will protect the mind so that the mind is not messed up by that positive and negative, so that ego and selfishness is not concocted. That's the, the new way. And then the new life that results from this new way of living is a life that is free of positive and negative. The, either when, when positive and negative is prevented completely, then it's a life that is completely untroubled by the the falseness of positive and negative. The positive and negative doesn't even happen. Or, if even if the positive and negative still occurs, the mind isn't touched by it. The mind doesn't doesn't buy into the the values positive and negative. And so it's as if the positive and negative didn't exist. Although the positive and negative may happen, they don't exist spiritually because they have no effect or influence on the mind that is protected by the new way of living. The old life <coughs> doesn't have a way of knowing and having a tamayata. And so the positive and negative can tread upon the mind. In the old way, the positive and negative are walking all over the mind, stepping on it and stomping on it. Because there's no there's no understanding of a tamayata to protect it. In the new life, there's a there is an understanding of a dhammayada. There's a thorough understanding of it so that positive and negative can't tread upon the mind. So the old way is one where positive and negative are walking all over the mind. In the new way, the positive and negative can't, can't tread on the mind at all. The old way doesn't have a tamayata. The new way has a tamayata. The new life that is that has a tamayata must must use three tools. There are three fundamental tools that must be used for the new life that has a tamayata. The first is sati, mindfulness. The second is panya, intuitive wisdom. And the third, samadhi, collectedness of mind. <clears throat> if we <clears throat> count in, the <clears throat> in this way, we have three mindfulness, intuitive wisdom, and collectedness. However, if we wish, we can, we can distinguish between two important aspects of panya. The first is all the, all the knowledge and wisdom that has been stored up, that has been gathered and stored. And this we can just call wisdom or intuitive wisdom, panya. But then the second aspect of, of panya is that wisdom, that understanding and insight, which is used specifically for the situation that one is facing. For whatever is occurring right now 
in the mind. Sampachanya is the specific wisdom that needs to be applied to the specific circumstances of this moment. And this we can call Sampachanya, applied wisdom, <clears throat> insight in action. And so there are two aspects to what is broadly called wisdom. There's the general wisdom, panya, and then the specific applied insight of sampachanya. So if we, if we count in this way, then there are four things. There's mindfulness, general wisdom, then applied wisdom in action, a specifically applied wisdom and then collected <coughs> collectedness. This can be compared to <coughs> the difference between Panya and Sampachanya can be compared to the medicine that we keep in the medicine chest at home. In the medicine chest there are all kinds of medicines. But when one is ill, one chooses the specific remedy or the specific medicine for the illness. One doesn't take and eat the whole, the whole medicine chest. Or it can be compared to weapons. If one is a soldier, one, one has all kinds of different weapons. But when, when one goes to fight, you only take the weapon that you can use. And so we have what's stored up and then we have what <coughs> is applied directly, specifically, to immediate circumstances. And this we call Sampachanya. Now we'd like to look at how these, these things work, how these four tools work together. Whatever circumstances arise, first, sati is aware. Sati is aware, it knows what is happening. Sati asks, what is this and what's to be done? What is this and what's to be done? And then sati retrieves, or sati goes to wisdom. Sati recollects wisdom. It goes to that big stock of wisdom that is somewhere in the mind and then chooses or is able to find the specific wisdom needed to, to deal with the circumstances of the moment. That general wisdom is panya, but out of all that panya, sati brings the specific wisdom or sampachanya to deal with the immediate situation. <clears throat> and then the sampachanya understands what's taking place and responds appropriately so that there's no dukkha. If, however, there isn't enough strength for sampachanya and panya to function fully, then samadhi, that collectedness of mind which has tremendous power, that will provide the strength for, for wisdom and applied wisdom to to act appropriately. And so in this way the four work together. These are four comrades that you that must function together. There's they're a team. And if there's proper teamwork between these four friends, then no problems arise. So first there must be sati, mindfulness, to be aware of what's happening and then to go to wisdom. If sati correctly recollects wisdom, 
then wisdom can be applied. Wisdom has a quality of sharpness. Wisdom is very sharp in order to cut through the problem. But sharpness is not enough. There also must be weight to, to provide the force behind the sharpness. Just the sharpness won't cut the problem. There also must be a weight behind it. And this weight is provided by samadhi, by that collected power of mind. And so, first there's some situation, and there's got to be awareness of it. If there's awareness, then it can bring this sharpness in weight to cut through the problem, or to cut it before it even becomes a problem. Of course, the, the first key is that there is mindfulness, that there is this sati. Without that, then there's nothing to get the wisdom. Without sati, w any wisdom and knowledge is completely useless. Without mindfulness, wisdom can't be applied. Samadhi is useless. It can't be used in an appropriate way, it can't serve its purpose. So having wisdom or samadhi without sati doesn't do us much good. There has to be this, this sharpness, this speed, this carefulness and attentiveness, attentiveness of, of sati. And then if it's just in time, if sati is completely spontaneous, immediate, and brings wisdom and samadhi into action immediately, then it's in time. It's right in time to, to prevent any problems from arising. So one must, must have sati. It's, if it's confused or fuzzy, then the whole thing falls apart. There must be clear, sharp, very quick sati. Or to put it very briefly and simply, mindfulness is the speed which is in, is in time, which is just, sati is the speed. Wisdom is the sharpness, and samadhi, collectedness, is the, the weight. We're going to have these, these four things, sati, panya, sampachanya, and samadhi. We'll have these four things, or we can count them as three if we wish. We'll have these four, three or four things. If we have these, these four comrades, then there will always be a tamayata. There's, in the surrounding us, are myriad objects. And these objects are making contact with the mind via the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense. Whenever one of these objects, one of these sense objects, makes an impression upon the mind, if there isn't sati, then that contact will concoct positive and negative positive, in, depending on the case, either positive or negative values. Whence the positive or negative arise, if there still isn't sati, then that will concoct ego. Ego self, this illusion will be concocted and lead and be suffering. However, 
if there is sati to to meet the object as it contacts the mind, as that object, that sense object, makes an impression on the mind, if sati is there to meet it, to be aware that here is something, and to be aware of what it is, aware of its danger, and aware of what's to be done about it, then sati can bring wisdom and that object won't be able to concoct the mind into positive and negative. And, of course, the ego, the self, won't get concocted either. So it's crucial that sati is fast. These objects come in very quickly. Sati's got to be fast enough to be right there every time an object strikes the mind. And further, sati must be complete. If it's incomplete, imperfect, then it won't be able to function properly. So sati must both be fast enough, must be immediate, and it must be complete, whole. If it is, then it's possible to to uh, to meet up with any sense object and not turn it into a problem. If if mindfulness is complete and immediate, then it is able to confront any object that makes contact and then brings wisdom into play and that object is not a source of, of trouble and confusion. Not, it, that object isn't able to concoct the mind. However, if sati is incomplete, slow, fuzzy, confused, then any object when there is an object making contact with the mind, there, sati isn't there to confront it, to meet it. And then the element of ignorance, avicca dhatu, has an opportunity to come in. This ignorance element gets its chance and so it slips in. And then the mind is concocted by ignorance. And so foolish feeling is concocted and then craving is concocted and then attachment is concocted and then ego is born. The illusion, the stupidity of ego is concocted and then dukkha is concocted. So if Sati isn't quick enough and whole enough, then ignorance element gets his chance and there arises what we call dependent origination, Vaticha Samupada, where dependent on each other these various things happen. There's ignorant contact with the object, ignorant feeling, ignorant craving, ignorant attachment, ignorant ego and then dukkha. So without proper mindfulness, dukkha is dependently concocted and one, and then there is suffering in the mind. Now, on the other hand, if sati is complete and spontaneous, then it, it receives the object as the object makes contact then because of sati the ignorance the ignorance element has no opportunity opportunity to come in and then so there is wisdom there there is the element of enlightenment vicha datu when there is contact between the the sense organ the sense object in mind when these three meet when there is this contact that is watched over by mindfulness, 
then everything happens in a very natural way through the enlightenment element. <clears throat> so there is enlightened contact. There is correct contact or sense experience. And then the feeling, any feeling that arises is correct. Enlightened feeling. Then any, any want or desire, any aim about what to do in this situation is correct or enlightened. And then any action proceeds smoothly, naturally, without any dukkha. This we, we call dependent quenching. The old way, where ignorance comes in and then step by step dukkha is concocted, is called dependent origination. The dependent origination of, of suffering and misery. But the southern one, where sati is complete and fast, where there is there is wisdom, we call dependent quenching, paticca nirota, because at each stage, each moment, the mind is quenched, it's kept cool. The potential for the mind to get concocted is quenched, and so the mind, whatever happens in this progression from contact to feeling to, to desire, all of that is quenched, and so no dukkha arises, there's just cool, coolness. The one way is called dependent origination, which is the causes, the sequential causes of dukkha. The other way is dependent quenching, the, the maintenance of peace in the mind, the maintenance of coolness through mindfulness and wisdom. So in summary, mindfulness must be used in, in every situation, in all circumstances. Whatever is happening, sati is necessary. Sati must be there before anything is born as positive or negative before something takes on this positive or negative value, there must be sati there to prevent that positiveness or negativeness. Or even if these values of positive and negative have, have come, then there must be sati there to prevent the positive and negative from concocting ego. Or if, even if ego has come up, Sati must be there to prevent ego from tormenting the mind. And so whatever stage of the process, there must be mindfulness there. If mindfulness slips at an earlier stage, well then there's got to be mindfulness at the later stage to, to protect against this concocting of the mind. Even if dukkha arises, even if mindfulness is slipped to the point that there's dukkha. Mindfulness is absolutely necessary to remove the dukkha, to get rid of the dukkha. So no matter where in the, the, the mental process the mind is at, sati is needed. There's got to be sati there to, to deal with things properly. Mindfulness must be used in every situation. That means all the time, every, every moment. Mindfulness needs to be there to, to protect the mind from, from ignorance and concoct the positive and negative and the concocting by positive and negative. Mindfulness needs to be there to confront anything that comes and to struggle with it or to, to deal with it. And then mindfulness is necessary to destroy any concocting, any ignorance 
any positive and negative that has slipped, that has been allowed in. So whatever the situation, whether protecting or fighting against or destroying, mindfulness is necessary. There has to be mindfulness to, to meet the, the situation. And then mindfulness is necessary to recollect wisdom and apply the wisdom. And for there must be mindfulness if collectedness, if samadhi is going to provide its strength and energy. So mindfulness, let us stress once again, mindfulness is required, is crucial in all situations, whether in protecting against or in struggling with, or in destroying whatever, whatever the situation is. Next we must discuss panya. Literally, pa means complete <coughs> or thorough. Complete and thorough. Ya means knowledge, understanding. So panya means complete and thorough understanding. And the meaning of this is that panya is the complete and thorough understanding of things as they really are. To know things as they truly are, not to know them in some deluded or false way. So panya is this complete and thorough knowledge of things as they in, are in reality. This we call panya, often translated as wisdom. And then panya comes from vipatsana. Vipatsana is a word that we use now to mean a certain kind of activity of mind. Vipassana literally means, V means clearly, distinctly, directly, or even brightly, and patsana means to see. Vipassana, vipassana means to see directly, see clearly, see immediately, distinctly. When things are seen in this way, just the way the eyes can see certain things. If there's good sunlight and the eyes are clear and focused, there's no tension in the face, the eyes can see something clearly. In the same way, the mind can see the reality of things clearly, distinctly, immediately, directly. This is called vipassana. And vipassana results in Panya, understanding things thoroughly, understanding things correctly and completely. Vipassana sees the truth of everything, sees the truth of all things. What this means, the, all this truth, is more than we can describe in words. There's so much that is seen, or the completeness, the totality of the seeing is more than can be explained in words. We don't have the time. However, we can mention specific aspects of that seeing. We can, we'll talk about some of them. The first, the first aspect or quality of vipassana, when things are seen truly in their reality, is to see what we call anicchata, anicchata, the fact of impermanence, the fact of change. Anicca means impermanence. Tami, which is an adjective, then ka means the state of or the fact 
to this state what is seen as the, the fact of impermanence, this knowing of impermanence is the, the fact of impermanence, which we call anicchata, anicchata. When vipassana realizes the impermanence of, of things, then this is called anicchata. This is very important. This is the beginning of seeing things in terms of truth, seeing the reality of things, not just our illusions about them seeing the reality of things, and this is what will lead through vipassana to, to atamayata. So anicchata means the fact of impermanence, the fact that things are changing all the time. It's the fact of the, the instability the uncertainty of things, that they're, they're constantly changing. This fact of impermanence is something that is very important. But it, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus also taught this. His, the heart of Heraclitus' teaching was pantare, all flows, all flows, which means that everything is changing. Everything is in a constant state of change, of impermanence. Many of the Greeks, though, however, weren't so bright, and they, they didn't understand him and said that he was crazy. But this, this fact of impermanence is a fundamental understanding if we're going to live in line with truth. So we should, let's look a bit at this word anichang, impermanence. If we look, we'll see that all the things we call the datu, the, the natural essences, these natural essences aren't static. They're always they're always moving, and so the, the datus are, are coming together, clumping together, and something new is produced. For example, hydrogen and oxygen come together, and when they meet, then there's water. And so the, the datus, these, these natural elements, are constantly colliding and compounding and mixing. Whenever they come together, whenever bunches or hundreds or whatever of datus come together, then something new is produced. And since none of the datus are static, this activity of coming together and colliding amongst the datus is, is constant and there's nothing static about it, so the result is impermanence, or the fact of it is this constant impermanence. And it's not just the, the, the datus that are changing all the time, but when various clumps and clusters of datus come together, this is always changing all the time. <coughs> Take the bunch of datus that we call water, and then the other bunch of datus we call sunlight. When the two come together, we get, we get, we get steam or evaporation. And then when various clusters of evaporation gather together, then we've got clouds. And when the bunch of datus that is a cloud comes into contact with the datus that is coolness or coldness, then, <coughs> then there is rain. And so the, the datus themselves are constantly changing. And then the bunches of datus are also coming together, colliding, changing in a ceaseless process of transformation. So all these datus, all these things <coughs> are ceaselessly changing and transforming. There's this constant flow of change. And this is 
what has given rise to what we call evolution. The evolution of this world is nothing but this ceaseless flow, this ceaseless process of change and transformation. In this process of, <clears throat> of change, this impermanent flow of change, there are these things that are coming together and then creating or concocting new things. This is called sankara or concoction. This coming together and cooking up new things is called concocting. Every new thing that is produced is called a sankara, a concoction, the product of concocting. And then the things which are doing this concocting are called concoctors or sankara. All of this is called concocting or concoction in Pali, sankara, which can mean both the process of concocting, the results of it, or the concoctions, and the, the causes, the concoctors. In this, this flow of change, there is this concocting, this sankara happening ceaselessly. We can look at this in two ways. We can see that impermanence, anijang, is a flow of concocting, of sankara. Or we can look at it as sankara, the concocting, is a flow of impermanence, of change. So we can look at it in either way, that impermanence is the stream of concocting, or that concocting is the stream of impermanence. If now we <clears throat> look inside ourselves, look into our, our own bodies, we'll see that there is nothing but this flow of impermanence and sankara. In, throughout the body, anywhere that we might look, there's nothing but this stream of anijang and sankara. Whether on the crude level of body parts <clears throat> or down to these reef, this subtle level of atoms or even the tiniest subatomic particles, whatever it is, there's just this impermanence, this change of anijang and the concocting the sankara. Wherever we look throughout the body, whether on the crudest level or the most subtle, there's nothing but this concocting and impermanence. We can look from the aspect of corporeality or in the aspect of mentality. Corporeality is called rupa and mentality is called nama. In either aspect, there's nothing but, but this impermanence. In all the, the constituents of, of body and of mind, there is this constant flow of, of impermanence. In the physical and the psychic, there is just this, this sankhara, and anijang. For if we look outside, everything, all the objects of the senses, all the datus that make up all these things are, are constantly flowing, constantly changing in ceaseless impermanence. There's nothing outside us that isn't, that isn't changing all the time. Inside ourself, there's all this changing, constantly changing. And outside us, of us, there's all this change, this ceaseless change. If we really saw it completely, we'd be so dizzy that we'd die. But nature, or our natural ignorance, helps us, and so we don't see it. 
and then we, we don't get so dizzy and die or go crazy. But we've now got what's called vipassana, and there's wisdom, panya. And so we can look at all this change in a way that we see it. We see it deeply and thoroughly, but don't, we don't get dizzy and we don't, we don't die. <laughs> we don't die from seeing it. So everything <clears throat> within us and around us is constantly changing. When we, when we deal with these things, when we experience these things, of course, we want to be able to take advantage of them and find some benefit in them. And so we, we don't want them to change. We want to get something from them. And we, we don't want them to change. But however, they keep changing. It doesn't matter what we want. They're, they're always changing. Although we have this natural inclination to try and use things for some purpose and benefit. They, they just keep changing. And so this constant change is always in conflict with, with what we're trying to do. And so this, this fact of impermanence, anicchata, gives, gives rise to the fact of, of dukkha, dukkata. All these things that are constantly changing can never quite be what we need them to be. They can never really fulfill our needs. They can never really satisfy our needs. So there's this fact of the inability of these changing things to, to satisfy, to be what we need. And so this quality of dukkata, this, this fact of dukkata, it arises out of anicca or is, is within the fact of impermanence. So we want our, our wealth and property. We want it to be of use for us. We want it to last. We don't want it to change. We want it to be impermanent. But it's changing all the time. And so this, this hope, this wish of ours is biting the mind. These things because they can't be, be what they want, what we want them to be, are constantly biting the mind. They're biting and biting and biting, and this gives rise to the the characteristic of dukkha. This the way that impermanent things are biting the mind is called is dukkha. It's painful. It's miserable. So this is called dukkha the fact of dukkha within impermanent things. So these bodies are impermanent, or even this thing we call life is impermanent. It's all just constantly changing. Of course we want to, to derive some benefit from it, to get some value from it. But we have to just accept that it's constantly changing, so just let go of it. Let go of it all and let it change because it's going to change no matter what. But understand this change and then we can, if we can let go of the change, let it, just let it be, then of course we can derive some, some benefits and value from all this change of the body of life, but according to impermanence we can get what benefits we can out of impermanence if we let go of it. And then it doesn't bite the mind. The impermanence won't bite the mind and then there's no dukkha for the mind. If we can let go of the change, let go of the impermanence, then we're able to get some value and benefit from it. But it's even that benefit is impermanent. It's fleeting, it doesn't last. But if we can let go of it all, accepting the impermanence of it, then there won't be any biting of the mind. And then there's something a bit ridiculous for us that 
if something arises that is permanent, we don't like it. Say the food we eat never changes. We have to eat the same food over and over and over again. We get sick and tired of it. We get bored with it. So even if, of course, that's not absolute permanence, but any, if anything seems to not change, then we very quickly get bored and tired of it. So we don't even like permanence. This is how confused and crazy we are. If we, we, if we had to sit all the time, we, we'd hate it. We, we don't like to sit all the time. Or to stand, just stand, we don't like that either. Or to walk constantly, well, we don't like that. Or to lie down all the time, we don't like that. We like to change. It's natural to change from sitting to walking to standing and so on. And so we've got this illusion of permanence within impermanence. We're constantly deceiving ourselves, lying to ourselves. We keep telling ourselves we want permanence, but, but in fact we don't. But we're so mix, mixed up, we can't separate this this lie of impermanence that we see in the impermanence. If we regard something as permanent, if we regard it as permanent, but of course it isn't, it keeps, it keeps changing, then this bites, this claws the mind, there's, there's dukkha. This is, is, there's a misery inherent in grasping at things as impermanent and regarding them as permanent. So, so we need to realize the anicitta, the fact of impermanence in, in all things. Realize the anicitta and then we won't regard it as impermanent. By understanding anicitta, we, we don't regard things as nichang, permanent. And so we get, we're not, we don't delude ourselves with the imagined fact of permanence, nichata. So to keep things from biting us, we need to realize the anichata of them. We don't have to grab onto or, or attach to this idea of impermanence, but just in a natural way, realize the impermanence. And then there won't be, it won't be a, su a source of suffering. So we need to, to be aware of, to understand anicitta and then dukkata, the, the second characteristic of things. The first vipassana is anicitta, the fact of impermanence. The second vipassana is dukkata, the fact of, of misery or miserableness. And the third vipassana is anatata, anatata, the fact of not-self. Things are, are constantly changing, but we want them to be this or be that to satisfy some need or desire of ours. And so they, that impermanence bites, bites the mind. And then there is, there is dukkha. But who wants dukkha? There's not an, one of us here who likes to suffer. We all hate to suffer. We, but we can't control things. We think we want this and we think we can control things to get what we want. But because it's impermanent, things are just datus. They come together, they form, they break up, they, they work according to their own means. The datus have their own ways. They don't listen to our wants and desires. So this trying to control or wanting to control and have things our way doesn't happen. There isn't this, this control. There's no control of all these, all these impermanent things, of all these datus. This fact that there's nothing 
in control is what we call anatata, anatata, the fact of not self. There's no I or mine, no self that controls these impermanent things. The fourth vipassana is called dhammatikata, dhammatikata. This is that which is probably a, a strange word for you, but all it means is that this is the natural way of things. Things are naturally ordinary, ordinary just like this. The fact that things arise, change, and, and cease, this constant arising transformation and ceasing, is just the natural ordinary way of things. The facts of impermanence, of miserableness or dukkata, and the fact of not-self, that's just the natural way. Things are just ordinarily just like that. This is called kamatitata, the fourth vipassana, the fourth insight. We don't see the fact of this naturalness of things, the, the, the natural way things are. We don't see this because of our own stupidity. And so then there occurs the opposite of pamatitata. So things just are and must be impermanent, must be unsat must be unable to satisfy, and must be non-self. This is the naturalness of things. This is Tamatita dies, the, the naturalness that things are always changing, they bite if we grab on, and they're out of our control. There's nothing that controls them. Tamatita da, or naturalness. The fifth insight or vipassana is Tama or Dhamma Niyamata. Dhamma niyamata. All these impermanent things, all these things which are have no self that controls or owns them, that are just naturally like this. All of these things are under the power of the law of nature. Niyam means order or law, the natural law, the state of being subject to under the power of the natural law, we call tam, dhamma niyamata. Things are not under the control of any self or ego. They are merely under the power of the law of nature. And we call this fact the fact of the natural order or natural law, dhamma niyamata. So which of us is not under the control or not under the power of the law of nature? Are, is there anyone out there who isn't subject to the, the law of nature? Whether ourself or anyone else in this universe? Is there anyone who can say, nope, not me, I'm not going to listen to this law of nature, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be like that. Is there anyone out there who can, can say this? The sixth vipassana is called Itapajayata or Itapajayata, Itapajayata or conditionality. This is the natural law, the natural fact that everything depends on causes and conditions. In all this impermanence, all these things which are not self, in all of that natural, natural change, the change always changes according to causes and conditions. Itapachayata is the, the fact that with this as cause, this exists. With this as condition, this exists. There's always 
any existence of anything and the change of that existence is always dependent on causes and conditions. Itapachayata is the fact that this flow of impermanence is a constant transformation of conditions. And so can, things are always changing dependent on the change of the conditions. As because with this as condition, this exists. With this as condition, this exists. Take away the condition, this no longer exists. In terms of everything, the entire universe, both physical and mental, we use the word itapachayata. It applies to everything. But if we speak just about living things, especially the, the consciousness of living things, then we talk in a more specific way. We talk of paticca samupada, the dependent origination. How depend, because of these and these and these and these conditions, dukkha is, arises. And also of paticca nirota, dependent quenching, because of the quenching of this condition, the quenching of this condition, the quenching of this condition, dukkha quenches. Dukkha ends. So in the specific terms we call it dependent origination and dependent quenching. But in terms of everything, both physical, mental, living and dead, or living and, shouldn't say dead, living and non-living, <coughs> sentient and non-sentient, we use the word itapajayata, the fact, the law of conditionality. The understanding of itapachayata, conditionality, and paticca samupada, the dependent origination, is very important. The knowledge and understanding of these, these truths is crucial in understanding the mind and how suffering is concocted and how to eliminate suffering. We've discussed this in detail a few months ago and we recommend that you study this. If you'd like, you can listen, you can go find the tapes and listen to them and maybe in a year or so it'll be out as a book. But there's no need to wait for the book, you can <coughs> listen to the tapes. The seventh Vipassana is called Sunyata, Sunyata or voidness, voidness. Everything is just, sub, is, there's just all this itapajayata, this natural law of conditionality, things arising and transforming and ceasing, dependent on causes and conditions. If there's merely this itapajayata, then things are void of self. There's this voidness, the things having, being completely, having this state of being void of self. Things happen according to this itapajayata. They don't happen because they're selves. And so there's this seventh insight of sunyata, the voidness, that things are void of self. And when there's if there's things are void of self, then there's nothing to be positive or negative. If there is a self, it might be positive or negative. But when there's just the, the constant flow of change according to the Dhamma Niyamata, the natural law, when there's this constant change in that, there isn't anything that can be taken to, as a self, as owner or controller. So there's just, there's the voidness. And if it's void of self, it's void of anything that is positive, that could be positive or negative. And so it's void of concocting. There's nothing, there's, and it's, it's void of dukkha. Voidness means void of self, 
void of positive and negative, void of the concocting of the mind, void of the defilements, and void of dukkha. Or in essence, all this, <clears throat> this voidness is called sunyata. But the, most simply, the essence of sunyata, the essential meaning of sunyata is void of self, void of I in mind. This fact is called sunyata. The Buddha stated in a concise principle that no. sunyo loko atena wa atana yena wa. The universe, the universe is void of, of self or any categories of self mm. and atena wa is ata is self, atena wa is categories of self mm. and then ataniya means concerning self, ataniyena wa is con categories concerning self. The universe is is completely void of self and things concerned with self, of categories about self and the things concerned with self, ata and ataniya. And so, obviously, if there's no self, then there's nothing that belongs to self. There, if there's no I, well, then there can't be any mine either. But because we're rather stupid, we go and there's I and ego and self and soul all over the place. And so then we, we scoop in everything as mine, mine, mine. No I, no mine. That's short and simple. So whether we look around outside us or we look inside, seeing that there's nothing but voidness, voidness outside, voidness inside. Everything is void of self. Seeing this voidness, then there is the eighth vipassana. We realize, oh, it's just like this. This is just how it is. It's just like this. Seeing that all this voidness is it's just how it is. It's just this. This is called da ta da. Just like this. Just this. Or the the in a more philosophical way, the thusness of things. It's 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 thus. It's not like that or though over there. It's just thus. Seeing this thusness of voidness is called tatata, the eighth insight. <clears throat> when things are tatata, thusness, there's how could there be anything positive? If things are thus, how can it be positive or negative? In thusness, there's nothing to concoct positive or negative, the meanings, the values of positive and negative. So in that in data da there's there's the thusness that has nothing to do with positive or negative. All the pairs of opposites, every duality whatsoever, such as good and evil, right and wrong, male and female, up and down. All of these are merely thus, thusness. They all are, in truth, just thusness. <clears throat> all of these dualisms are, are leading to the qualities or the, mean, the values positive and negative. All of these dualities are concocting the positive and the negative. But to, to see that there's, there's no real duality in them, there's none of this positive and negative, this is the ta-ta, thusness. 
we need to experience, to consciously experience and realize that all these dualities are tricking us, deceiving us, lying to us. And every time we buy their lie, we suffer for it. When we, when we realize this, then we see, then we develop the understand, the eighth vipassana of tathata, realizing thusness, things no longer can deceive us, they no longer can trick us. None of these dualities can suck us in and make us suffer. When there is this highest insight of tathata, thusness, then there is no way that the qualities positive and negative can arise to the mind. The mind is, can't be touched by positive and negative. Nothing, con con nothing concocts the positive and the negative. And then the positive and negative, so there's no positive and negative to concoct the mind. And so the mind is in a state of unconcoctability. The mind can't be concocted. It's at total peace. And so this is the ninth insight, atamayata, the knowledge that, the knowledge of uncoctability, that nothing can concoct the mind. And then I, I has disappeared. I is completely gone. So there are these nine insights. And together these nine insights are what we call panya, wisdom. We said earlier in this talk that in dealing with any situation there must be mindfulness. Mindfulness retrieves wisdom and applies the wisdom. Wisdom is made up of these nine insights, anicata, dukata, anatata, dhammatitata, dhammaniyamata, itapajayata, sunyata, datata, and adhammayata. These are the, our nine weapons, the nine kinds of weapons. You can't remember all the names there. They're on the vocabulary list at the meditation hall under the words, the, the nine tas the nine tas, because they all end in ta, ta, ta. These nine weapons, in any situation, all mindfulness just takes the right weapon to, to take care of the, the situation. To take and use the weapon requires strength, and this strength is applied by samadhi the collected mind that has the qualities of purity, stability, and readiness. And so, there are all these tas, these weapons, that make up wisdom. Mindfulness selects the right wisdom. The use of that wisdom, of the appropriate wisdom, is sampachanya, applied wisdom, and then samadhi provides the strength and power to, to use the weapon correctly. And then in this way, nothing can concoct the mind into positive and negative. Nothing can cause suffering. <clears throat> the matter of atamayata isn't finished yet, so if you can put up with another talk, we'll continue tomorrow. Today, but for today, that's all. Thanks for, for being patient, tolerant, and enduring. <laughs>